In this presentation, we'll talk about modeling with elastic elements, and we'll deal with both translation and rotation systems. In translation systems, our inertia is a lumped mass, and in rotation systems, it's a lumped mass moment of inertia. Let's look at some of the simplest kinds of examples of these two types of systems. In the first, we'll have a mass attached to a spring. The mass is given by m, the spring constant is given by k, and we measure the motion of the mass from the undeformed length of the spring as x. For this system, our free body diagram can be drawn as shown here. We have x pointing toward the right. This defines the positive direction for this variable. And we have f spring also pointing to the right. This defines the positive direction for f spring. Then the relationship between these variables is given by f spring equals minus kx. For the rotation example, we have the inertia attached to a rotary spring attached to a wall. The rotary spring's constant is given as kt. The rotation of the inertia is given by angle variable theta. If we make a free body diagram for the rotation of this inertia, it looks as shown here. We'll have theta as positive in the counterclockwise direction. And it'll also label the restoring torque from the spring, T spring, as going in the positive direction for counterclockwise. The inertia is given by the variable I. And the relationship between the torque from the spring, the restoring torque, and the angle of deformation of the rotary spring is given as follows. T spring equals minus KT times theta. The minus sign is present because the positive direction for both the angular deformation and the torque is counterclockwise. That is, their both positive directions are the same. Therefore, when theta is positive, the restorative torque should be acting clockwise, hence the minus sign. The textbook by Palm has a table of the spring constants of various mechanical systems based upon the Young's modulus and the geometry of the system. We'll take a look at a few of these here. The first element given is a coil spring of radius r, wire diameter d, and number of coils equal to n. The spring constant is given in terms of these variables. The second element is a solid rod that's undergoing axial stretching or compression. The rod's area is A and its length is L. Young's modulus is E. Similar equations are available for the cantilever beam and the fixed end beam. These are given in terms of the length of the beam, the Young's modulus, the width and height of the beam cross section. It's important to know that when the spring constant is defined for one of these beams, that we have to look at the particular loading condition. That is, where is the load being applied? This would be an applied force. And where is the deformation that's being described? Also important is to consider what the boundary conditions are. A fixed end beam is not the same as a free free beam. Remember these results are from a static test. The external force that's being applied is being applied at a particular location. The restorative force is applied by the beam is also supplied at this location. 
The last two elements given are torsional elements. A coil spring again, but now in torsion, and a hollow shaft. As I mentioned previously, the relationships listed in this table are relationships between the applied force and displacement. For example, for the cantilever beam relationship, the force is applied at the end of the beam and we're measuring the displacement at the end of the beam. So this is a static setup. This is like Hooke's law. We're applying a force and we're seeing what the displacement is. Now, if there was a mass at the end of the beam and the beam was displaced by this amount, then the restorative force would be equal to this static force and would obviously be working in the opposite direction since the restorative force in a static system acts opposed to the applied force. Let's look at an example so as to make this more clear. We'll have a cantilevered beam. It's attached here to a floor with a large lump mass on the end. An external force is applied to the lump mass and we'll measure the displacement. The external force is positive directions to the right and the positive direction for the displacement x is also to the right as indicated. The lump mass is considered rigid and point-like and the cantilever beam is considered massless. It's purely an elastic element. If mass m is moved to the right, the cantilever will be deformed and in response the cantilever will exert a restorative force on mass m, trying to push it back to the left. The table gives this restorative force relationship, that is the force acting on m from the cantilever beam, due to the displacement x. We can make a simple mechanical model of this system, consisting of a spring and a lump mass. The lump mass has the same mass as before, capital M, and the spring has a stiffness K, which is equal to E W H cubed over 4 L cubed, where W and H are the width and height of the beam cross section, L is its length, and E is the Young's modulus. Of course, this equation comes from our table. This is a reasonably accurate model of the cantilever beam system. However, this model can be improved. The cantilever is really not massless. We can make a more accurate mechanical model by adding some additional mass to cap M. The amount of additional mass is 23% of the mass of the beam. If we lump in this additional mass with cap M, we'll get a more accurate model. It'll more accurately reflect the natural frequency of the system, that is, the poles. This model will still only capture the first mode of the system. To make a model that could capture the second and higher order modes, we would need to take the cantilever beam and break it up into smaller inertial and stiffness elements. That is, we'd need more lump masses and more springs. You might be asking yourself why 23% of the beam mass should be added? Why not all the beam mass or 50% of the beam mass? And the answer is that this is due to the energy. Recall that the mass is a way of kinetic energy storage storing energy in terms of the velocity of the component. And not all points on the cantilever beam are moving with the same velocity. Clearly, as the beam vibrates, the end of the beam is doing most of the moving. So only the mass at the end of the beam is fully participating in the vibration. The mass that's near the fixed end of the beam is barely moving at all. So there's not much kinetic energy being stored at that location. 
This is why it's only 23% of the mass of the beam that should be lumped at the end. It should also be pointed out that we treated the lump mass at the end of our cantilevered beam as if it was a point-like mass, as if it had no spatial extent. If the lump mass at the end of the beam had considerable spatial extent and was not point-like, then the kinetic energy of its rotation might also be an important contribution. In that case, the appropriate amount of mass to lump at the end might be different than we've indicated here. The first mode of this cantilever beam system would still act like a mass on a spring, but it might not be easy to say exactly what value of mass should be used. I'll close this presentation with a discussion of linear versus nonlinear elastic elements. As we've been discussing so far, we've been dealing with linear elastic elements. This is the ideal spring. The relationship between the restorative force and the displacement is given by F spring equals KX. And if we graph F spring versus X, we of course find that to be a line of slope K where k is the spring constant, or stiffness, of the elastic element. For a linear elastic element, if we double the amount of deformation x, we'll double the amount of restorative force. This, however, is not true if the elastic element is nonlinear. Many real elastic elements in mechanical systems are not actually linear but they often behave as linear over some range of deformation. There are two types of elastic elements that are nonlinear, the hardening spring elements and the softening spring elements. In the hardening spring elements, the restorative force increases faster with deformation than would be governed by a linear spring law. In the softening spring elements, the restorative force increases more slowly with increased deformation than would occur if the spring element was a linear spring element. If a nonlinear spring appears in a mechanical system, then the mechanical system itself is nonlinear. This means it's not governed by linear differential equations. And so many of the techniques we've learned in this class, such as Laplace transform, convolution, and so on, cannot be used for this kind of system. So we're very much interested in mechanical systems which behave linearly, since we'd like to use these powerful tools. As long as the forces that are acting upon the system result in deformations that are within the linear range, of the nonlinear spring element, then we can treat the overall system as linear. In this case, we can use the advanced techniques we've been learning in this class to perform analysis of the system.